Well, good evening and welcome to the passage here at Crossroads Christian Church. Um, tonight we're talking about trusting God's providence and it's part two. Um, and while I was going to finish um, the book of Genesis uh, tonight and then look at another aspect uh, next week, we'll be finishing it next week as well as looking at, at that aspect um, of the blessing of Judah and his leadership. Um, but tonight we're going to focus on uh, just a couple of different narratives uh, that are in the text in, in chapters 46 through 48. And, um, and I want to tell you that we're, tonight we're going to handle it just a little bit differently. Um, I'm not presenting uh, any blanks. And the reason for that is we get into um, Jacob's story and Joseph's story. I'm going to be reading uh, sections of scripture. And I'd really like for you to have uh, those references so that you can kind of look back and, uh, and, and maybe see, you know, some of the things that, uh, that I have, uh, uh, have seen in the text. And, and, um, and so to get us started, I just want to go back and, and talk about uh, this past Sunday. Uh, Emily and the worship team uh, used the song Waymaker. And there's a phrase that's repeated over and over in that. And, and the, the phrase is, that is who you are. Um, God, you are the way maker. That is who you are. And for some people, it, it might repeat too many times. But, but to be honest with you, I, I kind of love that repetition because you and I sometimes need that kind of repeti repetition in our lives to remind us that he is in control, that he is sovereign, and he is indeed the way maker. I mean, even here, he shows himself in the stories of the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he, he shows that he is in control. Uh, even with all that Joseph has experienced in our story, being sold into slavery, you know, first of all, being, uh, it being revealed that his brothers were going to bow down before him, and, and he made the mistake of telling his brothers that. And, and, and then also, but I mean, again, was, was that a mistake or did God, to, and maybe it was a mistake for him to, to, to share that. But then God takes it and he, and he turns it um, for the good of Jacob and his sons uh, because Joseph is in the position that he's in. So all that he's experienced, you know, being in Potiphar's house, uh, being falsely accused um, of, of sexual misconduct, uh, being imprisoned. And then, you know, as he does a favor for a couple of guys who are there with him, uh, the one forgets him. For two years. And so through all that Joseph ex has experienced, we need to understand that God was always working. And it seems that Joseph kind of had that in mind uh, as, you know, as, as he's being used with his gifts of interpreting dreams, he had to realize that it was God who was blessing him and bringing a uh, blessing uh, to him. And, and so you know, it'd be easy to look at this story and say, oh, it's all about reconciliation. Jacob is, is coming uh, to, to Egypt to meet up with his son that he, that he believed was dead. Um, it, it's easy to, to think about Joseph and, and the celebration that he might have felt of bringing his family into Egypt so that they, they would be taken care of and, and they would be secure. Um, but, but there's more to this story, you know, I think. And, and, and here's the question I have. Um, I wonder, do we ever truly understand the impact and plan God is working in our lives? And I want you to hang on to that question as we go through uh, the text tonight. And, and let me repeat it. I wonder, do we ever truly understand the impact and plan God is working in our lives? Do we understand the scope of it? Do, do we understand the big picture? I mean, do we understand the impact that our lives might have on others? And sometimes we get to see that, uh, but other times maybe that blessing is far off. You know, maybe, maybe it won't happen until after you uh, and I have departed um, from this world and we've gone home to be with the Lord. And so as we get started this evening, I want to look at, uh, and again, I've got headings throughout, 
And the first heading I have is this one, Joseph is alive. Joseph is alive. And in Genesis 45, uh, chap, uh, chapter 45, verses 25 through 28, it's talking about uh, Joseph's brothers going back from Egypt. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned and he did not believe them. Okay. And so understand this Jacob was convinced he would never see Joseph again because he thought that he had been killed by this wild beast. And so Jacob is, is absolutely shocked and, and he doesn't believe them. But, but verse 27 says, But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. And, and, and so Jacob, he, he is absolutely um, taken back by this revelation that Joseph is still alive. And, and so, you know, in a moment, he goes from being convinced that he would never see Joseph again. Now he is convinced that Joseph is alive. So, so much so that he's willing to go from the land that he was promised into the land of Egypt. And so I've titled the, the next section, Historical Markers. I remember, I remember as a kid, and, and even, even today, I'll, I'll drive past some, you know, uh, some signs that say historical marker ahead. And there's a part of me, there's a desire in me that wants to stop and, and wants to check out uh, what this historical marker is. You know, I, I just, I love all that. And, and in my mind, um, that's exactly what Jacob uh, experiences as he's on his way to Egypt. Uh, ver chapter 46, verse one. So Israel set out, with all that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. And so God shows up in Beersheba, and, and it's, it's really no surprise. Jacob makes a stop at Beersheba. And if you remember uh, in Abraham's life and in Isaac's life, Beersheba had a part to play because it was there that Abraham dug a well and he and uh, Abimelech had, had a conflict over it. And then later on uh, in chapter 26, Isaac, also deals with that well. And, and the point is that Abraham and Isaac have worshiped there as well. And so he's back at this, what I call a historical marker, and, and it is setting his sight on what God has in mind. I mean, did you catch it? Uh, in fact, in chapter 26, Isaac is told, do, do not go down to Egypt. Okay, he's warned not to. But here, God says, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And then catch this. He says, Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. You will be with Joseph when you die. All right. So, so uh, Abraham and Isaac have worshipped there. Um, it, it's been a place where their faith and their trust in God has been confirmed. And Jacob uh, visits this place. Now, I want to show you the significance of, of what God says. I will go with you. I will make you into a great nation there. I will go with you, and I will bring you back. We're going clear back to Genesis 15, and this is God dealing um, with Abraham. And, and, and so, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. 
but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not reached yet reached its full measure. And so, did you catch it there? Your descendants will go into a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Well, Jacob's journey to Egypt is the beginning of that. I mean, at first, at first, because of Joseph, the, the Hebrew people, um, the, the tribe of Israel or, or the nation of, not the nation of Israel yet, but the tribes of Israel, um, they, they get along fine for a few years. But as Exodus begins, and we'll see that in a couple of weeks, as Exodus begins, we're told that a Pharaoh came up who did not remember Joseph, did not remember the blessing that Joseph brought, um, not only to Egypt, but all the nations, okay? And so, um, so that brings us to, in our story, uh, two narratives. And the two narratives are uh, Jacob's perspective and Joseph's perspective. Uh, and so Jacob's story in Egypt um, is what I call a glimpse of God's plan. So Jacob's story in Egypt, uh, a glimpse of God's plan. And this is where we're going to have some scripture references come up on the screen. And I'll try to, you know, uh, go through them uh, not only in an orderly fashion, but uh, in a way that, that, that you all can turn there and, and keep, up, uh, keep up with me. And so I want to point you, first of all, to uh, Genesis chapter 46, verses 26 through 30. And so this is a part of Jacob's story uh, going to Egypt. All those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his sons, wives, numbered 66 persons. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, and that's uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, okay? Uh, with the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family which went to Egypt were 70 in all. And what I want you to understand about that, uh, the number 70 is looked at as being a full number, uh, uh, almost a perfect number. And so um, God is saying, you know, the, the, the perfect number of, of, of Israel's uh, family, Jacob's family, has come into Egypt. And, and so they are going to greatly um, multiply uh, as the story goes on. Now, Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. I mean, I just have to say this. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been away um, on a trip, a mission trip, or, or something like that. Um, but, but coming home is, is, is such a wonderful thing, or, or seeing your loved ones is such a wonderful thing. I can only imagine that, um, you know, for, for the shut-ins we have, um, you know, those who are in, um, in, in assisted living facilities, and in nursing homes and different places who for eight weeks now, seven, you know, seven, eight weeks now, um, can you imagine the joy they're going to have when they're able to receive visitors once again, you know? And, and so multiply that in a way when Jacob thought that his son was, was dead and, and Joseph thought that his father and, and his family had given up on um, imagine the emotion that's taking place here. And then verse 30 says, Israel said to Joseph, Jacob said to Joseph, now I am ready to die since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. It, it's interesting to me, and, and, and I don't have a whole lot to say about it other than just to note this. Have you, have you noted a couple times so far where, J where Jacob says, now is the time for me to die, okay? Now I can die, you know? 
and 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 here's the here's the funny part about it. Well, not so funny, I guess. The ironic part about it is he lives another seventeen years. Okay, and so um, that's kind of a glimpse of him coming in and seeing his son for the first time. Then the next thing I want to point your attention to is, is Genesis forty-seven, verses seven through ten. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, how, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. And then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. There's this double blessing that Jacob places upon Pharaoh or extends to him. But more importantly, I, I kind of want you to see in there, um, kind of, uh, there, there's going to be a contrast to the way he feels. Now, this is first coming into the land of, of Jacob understanding what God has just shown him, that, um, that, that God is going to come down into Egypt um, and, and then take them back out again. And that he's, he's basically going to die there in Egypt um, in Joseph's presence. Um, and, and so he says, the years of my pilgrimage, he's asked how old he is. The years of my pilgrims are, are 130. My years have been few and difficult. And I don't doubt that, you know. Uh, think about the things that Jacob has, has gone through. The deception of his father. Um, the, uh, the fleeing from Esau and then being deceived by his uncle Laban, right? Um, and, and all of that. And, and then on top of that, uh, his, he doesn't know this at the time, but the brothers, his own sons, have sold Joseph into slavery and told Jacob that he's, that he's no more. I would imagine that he could say that my years have been few and difficult. And he says, they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my father. And, and I really was puzzled by that statement. And, and so I was reading some commentaries. And basically what comes out of that is that, that Jacob understands that he's not going to live as long as Abraham or as Isaac. And a part of it is because he has not, I mean, according to the commentaries, he's, he's not honored his father and mother. I mean, he deceived his own father, okay? And, and so that's a part of what he's, he's sharing uh, there in that section. Uh, but, but then there's this, this kind of change. And so we go to chapter 47, verses 28 um, through 31. And it says, Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years, and the years of his life were 147. When the time drew near for Israel to die, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. I want to pause there for a second because you might recall uh, back in Abraham's story when he was sending Eleazar to find a wife for Isaac, he asked the same thing of Eleazar, put your hand under my thigh. And, and it's it's such a, a strange request, but it's basically um, an assurance that, that the promise will be kept, okay? And so uh, Jacob repeats that to Joseph, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt, but when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. And Joseph says, I will do as you say. But then Jacob said, swear to me. And then Joseph swore to him, and Israel worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. And that's actually probably better translated, he leaned on the top of, of his bed. Okay. So now, uh, one, one last passage, and it's kind of lengthy, um, but Genesis 48, verses 1 through 16. Sometime later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. 
Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan. And there he blessed me and said to me, I'm going to make you fruitful and will increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now, here's what I want to point out in, in, in those two sections that I've just read. I want you to notice that Jacob is, is pointing back to the land. He's pointing towards God's promises. Basically, Jacob is being led by the Spirit of God. And, and it's almost, you know, did you get it? He, he says, not only am I asking you to bury me among my forefathers, but he says, swear to me that you will do that. Okay? He's intense with this. And even here, he, he's, he's sharing with, with Joseph his heart and the mission and the plan that God has set before him. Verse 5 says, Now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to, to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them will be yours. Uh, in the territory they inherit, they will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. As I was returning for, uh, from Padan to my uh, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we were still on the way, a little des uh, distance from Ephrath. So I buried her there beside the road to Ephrath. Now, Ephrath is Bethlehem, okay? And so Rachel is buried um, near Bethlehem. And, and so I want to pause there and explain to you what's going on. And we're going to talk more about this next week. We're going to focus on Ephraim, Manasseh, and Judah next week. Okay, but but right now in the story, just understand that that Jacob has, has uh, Joseph has shown up to Jacob as, as Jacob is is growing weaker and he's dying, and Jacob says to Joseph, "Your two sons will be mine." And, and and so you may not realize this, but Ephraim and Manasseh become two of the tribes of Benjamin. I mean, you or uh, of uh, Jacob of Israel, um, you would think that it would be the 12 sons, right? Including Joseph and Benjamin. Um, and Benjamin is included, uh, a tiny tribe uh, within the tribe of Judah. But Ephraim and Manasseh are, are chosen here to take the place of two of the sons, and one of them is Joseph. Um, it, don't understand why, but oftentimes Ephraim and Manasseh are referred to as Joseph, okay? Because this whole blessing is kind of a blessing of Joseph, but it's also a blessing of his two sons. And, and so understand, they are taking the place of Joseph and Levi because the Levites become the priestly tribe and they don't have an allotment of land. They are, they are supposed to serve uh, the temple area, the tabernacle, um, that is their job, full-time job, the priestly tribe, the Levites. And so God has shown Jacob that Manasseh and Ephraim are to take the place of Joseph and Levi uh, as, as two of the, the 12 tribes uh, of Israel. He, he does say in verse 6, any children born to you after them will be yours. And so this is kind of an adoption process that, that, that Jacob, that Israel um, brings to, um, uh, to, to the table. Uh, so verse 8 says, when Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, who are these? That they are the sons God has given me here, Joseph said to his father. Then Israel said, bring them to me so I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were failing because of old age and he could hardly see. That's probably why he answered. I mean, there's some footnotes that say he says, who are these? Because this is the first time he's ever met them. I don't believe that. I think he simply can't see well. And so he's just saying, you know, who do these belong to? And Joseph says, uh, they are my sons. And Israel says, bring them to me so that I may bless them. Now, Israel's eyes were failing because of old age and he could hardly see. So Joseph brought his sons close to him, and his father kissed them and embraced them. 
Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your children too. Then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on his right toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left towards Israel's right hand, and brought them close to him. Now, I want to pause there and just say there are some who are, you know, they're pretty convincing that these are rather young boys. Um, you know, maybe their ages are seven and eight or eight or nine. And then there are others who believe that they're a little older than that, that they're maybe in their mid-teens or so. But, but however, they have bowed low before um, Jacob in honor of him. You know, Joseph bows his head to the ground, and then he presents his sons. And again, notice that on his left, he is presenting Manasseh so that Jacob will place his right hand on his head. And on his right, he is presenting uh, Ephraim, and, and that's so Joseph or so Jacob can place his left hand um, upon Ephraim's head. But watch what happens. And I'll explain more about this next week. But Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head. Though he was the younger and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. And so basically he does something like this. Placing his right hand upon Ephraim, the younger, right? Placing his left hand upon Manasseh, who should be receiving the, the birthright of the, of the right hand, okay? But that's not what Jacob sees. Remember what I said, Jacob is being led by the Spirit. He cannot see, and yet God is guiding him. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my father <coughs> Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. And so this blessing is, is laid out, okay? And, and, and again, what I want you to see, I mean, look at the contrast here. 17 years later, I mean, at first he's saying to Pharaoh, my, my years are few and difficult. And now 17 years later, this is, is how he sees his, 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 his walk. This is how he sees his life. May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called by my name and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly upon the earth. And by the way, they were called by his name because they were part of the 10 northern tribes, which were called Israel, the 10 tribes of Israel. All right, so, so here, here's the point. Jacob's story in Egypt is a glimpse of God's plan a glimpse of God's plan. Um, and, and, and what is demonstrated in his words and his, and his actions is that he is being led by the Spirit of God. And, and so why is, he being, why is he being so persistent? Well, that brings us to Joseph's story in Egypt. You know, what you need to understand is Joseph understood he was used by God. In fact, we're told in previous chapters that God blessed him to, to do what he was doing. And, and as he was doing what he was doing, saving the whole uh, earth uh, from famine, God was blessing him, you know? And, and so uh, here's, here's what I want you to see with Joseph's story. He's used by God, but, but is it to a point where he doesn't see beyond the immediate? And, and so... I put in your notes, and I'm careful about this, because it's just it's simply an observation. Joseph is being used by God, but is he now stuck? Stuck in the culture, stuck in comfort, stuck in the plans of men, okay? And so I want to show you a few things 
which I believe kind of demonstrate the fact that he indeed uh, is stuck. And so back in chapter 46 again, uh, verses 31 through 34, then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds, they tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? You should answer, your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle, to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to Egyptians. So you're going to be given this special land, and it was a special land, um, but you're going to be separate from the Egyptians because all shepherds are detestable. But catch the fact, then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen. All right. So next, let's look at chapter 47, verse 11. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramses, as Pharaoh directed. Um, but we're back in chapter 41, and, and basically this is a part of uh, you know, Joseph's um, history there in Egypt. But, but I want you to notice uh, a couple things. Uh, one, it says, before the years, this is verse 50, chapter 41. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, a daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God um, has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. Um, and so he's just naming him a blessing. He's, he's brought some joy. He's made him forget some of the struggles. And then verse 52 says, the second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. And, and so again, we'll talk a little bit about this next week, but if you're paying attention, then you should know that Ephraim and Manasseh were half Egyptian. They're half Egyptian, and we'll talk about the significance of that next week. But again, what I want you to see is that and and I'm not I'm not necessarily saying that um, he didn't have any other choice, but he marries an Egyptian girl. He has children with her. Um, it, not only an Egyptian girl, but the daughter of a priest of a, another religion, a, a false religion, and. And so uh, part of what I'm just sim simply suggesting, jo Joseph is absolutely used by God, but maybe he's become a little stuck. Um, Genesis 47, verses 13 through 26. I'm just kind of kind of refer to this. Um, you know, after a time, there was no money to buy food. Everybody had run out of money. And so the, the Egyptians and others come to Joseph and say, um, take our cattle. Okay, that's what we have to offer, take our cattle. So Joseph takes the cattle, you know, becomes Pharaoh's property. Eventually, they come back for, for more food, and they say, all we have now is ourselves and our land. And so uh, take our land from us and, and use us in, in whatever way. And so in, in all this, Joseph, again, is, is, um, he, he is, he is faithful. And in fact, he gets to the point where he tells the people, all right, um, you know, take a portion of this, this seed and plant it. And when your crops come up, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. And, it, and it's all kind of wise stuff. But again, notice that, that Joseph is really caught up. And again, it's God ordained, but he's he's not seeing he's short he's short sighted, near sighted. He's not seeing beyond. Okay, now, Jacob keeps reminding him, keeps giving him a glimpse of of what he's supposed to do, and and what or not really what he's supposed to do, but what God is going to do. And and Joseph 
again keeps demonstrating that he is, he's stuck. One last passage, and it's Genesis 48, verses 17 through 22. Remember, Jacob crosses hands. Right hand upon the younger, left hand upon the older. The younger is going to receive the birthright, the blessing. Um, and, and, and again, just kind of giving you a hint to next week, um, the commentators basically say, God sees differently than what we do. Um, for Joseph, the one to bless was Manasseh because he's the firstborn. And so when Joseph saw, verse 17 in chapter 48, when Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Understand this. Uh, people try, I think some people try to make more of this than, than what it is. I, I think Joseph kind of had in his own mind that the firstborn son should be blessed. That's Joseph's plan. But Jacob is seeing God's plan. And so when the crossing of the hands takes place, it's possible that, that all Joseph is thinking is he's got his hand on the wrong head. Okay? He, he, he doesn't recognize them. So, you know, he's crossed it up. And so it says he was displeased. He took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to him, no, my father, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. Now, I will say, and in the Hebrew language, what Joseph says there is not so. He's basically saying um, it's, it's never going to be. I mean, that is, is not going to take place. Um, and, and there's only one other place in the Old Testament where that phrase is used. And it's when Moses is speaking to Pharaoh and telling him that I need to take all of the people out to worship. And Pharaoh says, not so. That's never going to happen. Okay, and so it is pretty forceful. He, he's trying to say, no, you know, you need to bless Manasseh. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know he too will become a people and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he and his descendants will become a group of nations. He blessed them that day and said, in your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim. And Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm about to die, but God will be with you and take you back to the land. See, another reminder, he will take you back to the land of your fathers. And to you as one who is over your brothers, I give the ridge of land I took from the Amorites with my sword and my bow. And so we'll talk about some of the specifics of that next week. This is, this is what I want you to to see. And again, um, in some ways it may be conjecture, but, but I kind of see that Joseph doesn't always realize the scope. In fact, I don't think he realizes the scope of God's providence. Can I use an example? And I think it's one that'll hit home with all of us, at least those of us who were from Old Union and uh, Northland as we came together here, as we completed this project of this building. In some ways, we were short-sighted, we were nearsighted. Because as we've always said, we kind of took a collective sigh. God has worked, God has used us, and he's brought us here. But what we failed to see or failed to ask was now what? What's next, All right? And so we're in the process of doing that, you know, even, even now, of asking what's next. And so, again, and notice in the notes, I put used by God. Joseph is used by God, but now stuck, question mark. Is he hung up in the culture? Is he hung up in, 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 in the, the job that he's doing there that he fails to see? the scope of God's providence and where God wants to lead them. Well, again, Jacob is led by the Spirit. He's one who has a glimpse of God's plan every once in a while. It's not all the time, but every once in a while, he gets clarity once he remembers. Hey, this is what God is doing. 
Okay. And so here's, here's the question um, for all of us. Which story most resembles um, your understanding of God's plan for your life? Which story most resembles your understanding of God's plan for your life? I mean, are there times? In fact, what I would suggest is that we're both of them. I mean, at times, I think we see glimpses of, of God's plan. Um, and, 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 and understand this, even Jacob, Jacob did not necessarily understand the scope. I mean, Abraham, Abraham has promised his descendants will be as numerous as stars, and he manages to have, I mean, basically two sons, um, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac is the son of blessing. Isaac has promised the same thing. Your descendants will be as numerous as stars. Jacob has promised the same thing. And when they go into Egypt, there's 70 altogether. But it's when they come out of Egypt. The prediction is made clear back in Genesis chapter 15. And, and that's that's the faith and the trust that they had in God. Jacob wasn't always clear on God's plan, but he would he would get these uh, glimpses of of God's uh, glory and plan. And Joseph is is kind of nearsighted with it. It's possible that he doesn't realize the scope of God's providence. So, which one do we most identify with? And again, it's a, it's, a, it's a question for each one of us to wrestle with because I think we, we sometimes go back and forth. I mean, sometimes we become very comfortable in our culture. Um, we become, uh, you know, we, we do battle the way our culture does battle sometimes instead of understanding God's um, will and plan and, and the impact that we can have if we'll just simply wait on him and trust in him. You know, this, this, this helps me make sense of promises like uh, in the book of Romans when, when it said that, you know, God works all things together for good, um, you know, in those who love him. Or even Ephesians 2.10, which says that we are God's workmanship created in advance uh, to, to complete good works, which he has established for us. He's ordained for us to do. If we'll just simply allow him to guide and lead and not get stuck. Well, listen, I, I want to tell you this before we close. Um, and we probably, we probably don't say it enough, but man, we miss being together. I miss you guys, and um, and I know people miss being here. Um, but again, coming back to to God's will and His plan, um, you know, maybe just just for a little while longer. I mean, let's be patient and let's wait upon and see what God is going to do, um, because I believe He has some great things in store, not only for Crossroads but for the church. I mean, the church as a whole. I mean, do you understand? And maybe you don't, because we're seeing some things that we're not really um, necessarily conveying to everyone. But churches everywhere with live feeds and with recordings and the way we're doing the, this kind of thing, the impact and the it, it's far reaching. Let's just put it that way. There are so many people tuning in to the messages um, that are being presented. Um, and and that's not and that's not only here it's it's across the nation um, people are they're turning to us for a reason to have hope and and so our job is to give them that um, our job is to present that in in the messages that we preach and that we teach um, our job together is to fulfill that outside these doors, outside these walls. So let's, let's, kind of, let's kind of open our eyes and let's look around and let's see things 
um, try to see things from God's perspective um, and trust him uh, just as Jacob uh, trusted his God. Thanks for being with us. And again, we miss you. Uh, a special hello to anyone who is shut in. I, I can't imagine you know, what you guys are going through, but, but know that we're thinking about you and we're praying for you. And so our blessings on every one of you. Thanks for being a part of the God bless you.